Welcome back to the show. Now imagine it's 2004 and you find yourself in the most dangerous location in Iraq, in a firefight, and all of a sudden, you're shot in the head. But you survive. And after treatment, two weeks later, you return to the front line to fight alongside your fellow Marines. Now today we've invited my friend Brad Simmons, at the time a young 23-year-old Marine fire team leader who was a first Marine casualty during the first Battle of Fallujah. Now listen to this. This is an article published on the San Diego Union Tribune by Darren Mortensen. Fallujah, Iraq. One of the first bullets that the insurgents fired down the dusty Fallujah street on the April 6 ambush struck 23-year-old Marine Lance Corporal Brad Simmons in the head just beneath his helmet. The 7.62 round from an AK-47 impacted his right side, burrowed three inches below his ear, and burst through his right sideburn. It looked at first like a fatal wound. I actually thought he was dead, quote, saying PFC Philip Marquez, a friend who said he thought it was all over for their whole squad when bullets started crashing into the walls all around them, and he heard Simmons yell, I'm hit, Doc, I'm hit! But to Simmons, it wasn't finished. He was down, bleeding and stuff, and he's telling us, I'm fine, I'll be okay, Marquez recalled two weeks later. Jeez, I mean... We were supposed to be telling him that. Marquez said Simmons's grit inspired him and the others to fight on. He said, you sons of bitches, I'll be back, Marquez recounted from his spot behind the machine gun, eyes wide like he was reliving the moment. It was like a morale booster. It was weird. There were so many feelings flying around. That actually helped me. Marquez said. I just thought, okay, we're going to be all right. Now, as we get into this episode, I must warn you, Brad and I discuss the ugly side of war, the gruesome details of killing, uh, the confusing balance of morality when survival comes into question, and ultimately, a Marine's difficult journey back home to his family as he heals his head wound, both physically and spiritually. I've got to ask, what's your background? How did you end up in Fallujah and what did you do in the Marines? I was uh, 0311, a uh, rifleman, uh, nothing special. I wasn't like recon or nothing like that, just a regular old grunt. Uh, we took over uh, Fallujah, and that's where I spent, you know, seven months of my life in 2004. I think we took over in March, and we left around October, if I'm not mistaken. And it just, you know, we ran patrol into cities and, but ran, uh, you know, missions around Fallujah, the surrounding uh, Ambar province, you know, so when people ask me, you know, you know, about getting shot in the head, I just say, you know, I was a cowboy in Indian country. I got scalped that day. You know, that's what happens when you carry a rifle for a living. Sometimes you get clipped. I, from, from what I remember, one of the key images, one of the more gruesome key images were when, um, there's one day when four Blackwater contractors got ambushed. And um, after the secure, that small security contracting team got ambushed, um, some of the locals had strung them up and mutilated the bodies and tied them onto the bridge leading into the city itself. Uh, Fallujah has been a hotspot for insurgents to uh, spot stockpile both uh, manpower and weapons. Um, to launch operations from. And so as you were being picked for deployment to Iraq, did you know that you were headed into Fallujah? Uh, what did you know of Fallujah back then? Or what did you learn of Fallujah? Well, I mean, going into, uh, you know, Fallujah before we deployed, 
you know, we, we knew we were going into Fallujah, but at the time we didn't have any idea like how bad it was. You know, we just, we had just came back from the invasion in uh, 2003. So we were coming back from like Nazaria, stuff like that. And, you know, towards the end of our deployment for the invasion, it was pretty relaxed. You know, the opposition dropped off, you know, the insurgency hadn't started. So, you know, we really, like, you're going back to Iraq, a place called Fallujah. We're like, all right, you know, whatever. We didn't really think much of it. We thought it was just going to be, you know, more just the tail end of the invasion when everything kind of dropped off. And then my grandmother, this is, this is a true story. My grandmother uh, had a subscription to Marine Corps times and uh, I didn't, I didn't read the, I didn't read the newspaper. I lived it, you know? <laughs> so I called my grandma just to tell her, yeah, I'm going back to uh, Iraq and I'm going to a place called Fallujah. She's like, oh, the Marine Corps times says it's the deadliest place in Iraq right now. Like, oh, do do tell, you know, so that's how I found out about how, you know, serious it was from my grandmother reading Marine Corps Times. So, you know, we went in there and, uh, you know, we we did a pretty good train up for it. all of our uh, training for about four months was very centric around uh, uh, urban fighting. We we did some really, really good stuff. Uh, we went to Victorville. They have a uh, defunct housing project, uh, what do you call it, uh, on-base housing that was decommissioned because of asbestos. And we trained in asbestos-ridden buildings for about, you know, three weeks with uh, Royal Marine Commandos. So that was actually really cool. You know, British Army and Royal Marine Commandos that had experience uh, fighting in, uh, you know, Belfast, Northern Ireland. You know, so they came out, told us, uh, you know, some things that worked, things that didn't work, dealing with populations. So, you know, going into Fallujah, you know, as opposed to the invasion of Iraq, we thought we had a lot better tools dealing with the population because 2004 was, uh, you know, hearts and minds was a big catchphrase. You know, we got to win them over. You know, we, you know, we went into Fallujah knowing that it was going to be dangerous, but thinking that we could win hearts and minds and it would just settle down. It never did. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. You know, going into Fallujah, we, we knew it was going to be dangerous and leadership had us convinced that we could just through politeness, I guess you'd say, for lack of a better word, could kind of convince the people that we're not the enemy. And, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And we just kept getting more and more engaged and more and more, uh, more water on the bridge as far as bloodshed and violence, you know. So when we left in October, we really didn't feel like we accomplished the goal of pacification of the city. Where were you? Were you you were in country in in March when when those contractors got? Uh, yeah, yeah, we'd been in right? country. We'd been in Fallujah probably like three weeks at that point. In the mindset of it, uh, you know, we took over from uh, the army. You know, one of the airborne units. I don't remember which one. And uh, we were doing very aggressive things, very aggressive patrols, things of that nature, to try to let the local city leaders and fighters and whatever just just tell them that hey, we're not the army. You know, this isn't a knock against the Army. I just want to make that clear. You know, they were excellent, you know, excellent professional soldiers. You know, I worked with them a couple weeks leading up to uh, them leading. You know, they're very good. Uh, but, you know, their rules of engagement and the scope of their operations were very limited. Uh, you know, kind of zip in the city, do their thing and zip out. And, you know, they weren't looking for engagement. So, you know, that was their scope of operation is kind of snatch and grab missions, uh, you know, quick recons in and out of the city, no kind of, you know, sustained operation. So when we took over, you know, our leadership wanted to make a point to the city that, you know, we're here, we're going to go in the city whenever we want. So, you know, we did a lot of aggressive in-city patrolling, you know, those first couple of weeks. And then uh, when those contractors, you know, unfortunately got, you know, killed and strung up, you know, they, they dropped the bodies right off at our, our base and just kind of, you know, here, take your guys back. And, uh, you know, that that didn't sit well with, uh, you know, our leadership that was trying to make the point that, you know, don't mess with us. That kind of kicked off uh, us cordoning off the city, I guess you say. We were told our mission was to choke the city off. So we set up at all the main inroads and just didn't let anybody in with the idea that eventually, you know, they'll run out of food resources and just give up. You know, that, that was our goal. Just to kind of give you a scope of it, you know, our base was only uh, probably half a mile away from the city, maybe a mile. And the, the main road to the city was right in front of our base. And, you know, you'd literally see like a dump truck or a, you know, flatbed truck 
loaded with like 30, 40 guys with AKs drive by the drive by the base heading into the city. It's like, I wonder where those guys are going and what they're doing. You know, like you, you'd see that like day in and day out, just like trucks load of dudes armed to the teeth, just going into the city because they, that's, that's just what you did. You, if you were in surgeon fusion early 2004, you, you went to Fallujah. <laughs> so you were talking about the, the tail end of the invasion, which the invasion was 2003. That that did not take a long time for insurgency to really take a foothold in Fallujah, didn't it? No, no. I, well, if, you know, as it was explained to me at the time, you know, by our leadership was, uh, you know, Fallujah was bypassed in the invasion simply because, uh, you know, the goal was Baghdad. So, you know, when the push was being made for the country, if they could bypass an obstacle like Fallujah, they did. And the uh, assault just kind of breezed right by Fallujah, which was a you know a major Saddam supporter, you know Sunni Triangle, you know his people. So once uh, you know they toppled Saddam, now they have these strongholds like Fallujah and uh, you know Huseiba and a couple others that were just lousy with his loyal fighters. And that's kind of what we were doing in 2004, 2005, just clearing out these strongholds we created by bypassing them. So let's head back to where we were on the timeline. So the contractors, um, so the insurgents had just dumped the bodies of the contractors outside of the American base. Yeah. Um, what now? What happened? What What was the response to that? Uh, well, I mean, the response was kind of uh, mount up. Uh, you know, I I was out on ambush patrol. We had a guy that was uh, dropping mortars on us from his pickup truck. So. You know, I was out on an ambush patrol trying to catch them. I think I was out there about a week and I came back and I just checked in with COC and uh, our platoon uh, guide. You know, he's a sergeant that's kind of like the assistant manager of the platoon, for lack of a better word. He said, hey, mount up. We're going back out. He's like, oh, geez, I got time to take a leak. I mean, <laughs> how where are we going? How long are we going to be there? What do we need? He's like, yes, <laughs> everything. Get in the truck. Like, all right you know so jumped in the truck and went to our uh you know spot outside the city we we, we really weren't told what was going on we just said get in the truck uh we'll, you know you'll be briefed on the way and of course you know the city's only five minute drive ten minute drive so ten minutes later we're out of the vehicle and like all right what's going on like we don't know yet you know just get in defensive positions and wait okie dokie and that's when the rpg started getting shot at us it's like, all right, this got this went from zero to a hundred in like three seconds. This is welcome to Felucia, boys. <laughs> Literally, we got out, we 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 got we uh we rode in a was AAV amphibious uh, assault vehicle. That uh -huh. was our ride, and we got out of the AAV and we we're standing there just trying to figure out what we're doing. And you just started hearing foo 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 of the RPGs overhead. It's like, okie dokie. I don't know what the plan is, but uh, you know, we we better figure it out real quick boys you know <laughs> you guys were rocking the m16a2s uh no we and... had a4s we had a4s oh, yeah, a4s okay yeah we just got the a4s uh you know probably like four months before we deployed to uh fallujah so we got the a4s okay. with the uh a cogs the yeah i mean i hadn't cogs. i hadn't used it in combat yet but i you know i had it and i i wasn't a big fan of it until i actually had to use it in combat as soon as I, I actually started using it, you know, in combat situations, I, I loved it. It was the greatest thing since sliced bread for a guy going from iron sights to, a, you know, a cock. Now, I know in the second battle, uh, the, the second battle of Fallujah, which is widely known as one of the bloodiest urban battles that's taken place since Boy City. Yeah. Uh, but... I don't hear much about the first. The, the first, my understanding is that you caught on off and you pressured the city and then were called to back off. How did that progress? So you guys, you guys went in, you started pulling security. You guys had a four strapping with all the ammunition you could pack in. I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but we were still uh, limited to six magazines and no grenades, you know, even with all that going on, because again, the idea was hearts and minds. So they did things like uh, only gave grenades to NCOs and they had one grenade and everybody else had six magazines, you know, it was kind of ridiculous in retrospect, but that was, just, you know, the mentality of, you know, we're not here to fight. We're here to win hearts and minds. Like, okay, so now we're going into combat with less than a combat load, no frags. That's brilliant, gentlemen. But yeah, yeah. So 
I'm kind of responsible for us going into the city, you know, me getting, you know, shot. Uh, so pretty much the way it worked, you know, I'll try to explain this as quickly as possible. So our position was this railroad bridge uh, right outside Fallujah, one of the main end roads. And uh, you had the railroad bridge and then you had probably like 400 yards of just open terrain, no cover, no concealment, nothing. And then the very edge of the city, like, you know, three to five story buildings. I mean, it was literally just like city, desert open ground, and then railroad bridge, you know, and kind of like a 400 yard standoff between us, you know, which if we stuck to our original plan of just cordon off the city, that's an excellent position. You know what I mean? They're outside the, you know, standard Kalashnikov range, you know, we're well inside the M16 range. You know, we also had snipers and, you know, stuff like that. So ideally that's an excellent position. However, General Mattis shows up, you know, so, you know, General Mattis was uh, making kind of spot checks on all the positions. And, uh, you know, we're kind of like in a stalemate. We're not we're not doing anything except for watching the road and taking pop shots at each other. And then General Mattis shows up and our uh, uh, company commander wanted to, you know, kind of look good. So he came up with this uh, box recon mission for me and my squad. <laughs> So we, we, you know, we, my squad was on react, you know, so we're only supposed to be, this was kind of like our downtime or chill time. We were only supposed to be active if there was like a situation that we needed to, you know, check out, you know? So I just took my boots off and, you know, my platoon commander, who's a hell of a guy, uh, you know, great, great officer. He comes over and he goes, Hey guys, check this out. You're going to do a box recon in the city. Like what? <laughs> So we, you know, me and my nine guys walked across 400 yards of like open, uncovered terrain into the edge of the city. And then we went, you know, our orders were to go like five blocks up, five blocks over and then get out and then report on what we saw. And this was all because General, you know, General Mattis was on site and, you know, my company commander wanted to like give him a show. So that's when I got that's when I got ambushed. That's when we got ambushed and I got injured. So now you got a squad of Marines, you know, one of them's down, you know, one of the squad, uh, the uh, uh, small unit leaders, the team leader shot in the head. So, you know, that's when the tanks and everybody else started coming in to, you know, get me basically. So now we're not cordoning off the city. We are invading the city, <laughs> you know, a company of Marines just going into the city, you know, guns blazing with an election coming up in November, you know, <laughs> you know, keep in mind, you know, Bush's re-election was, you know, November of 2004 and here it is April, 2004. And you got like this rogue group of company of Marines just without orders going into the city of Fallujah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, so, you know, I, I, you know, they're coming to get me and now, you know, kind of, I was, um, medevaced out, but I'm told that it like, they had the mentality was like, oh, screw it, we're here, let's just keep going. So they went about, I want to say like six, seven blocks before somebody hit the panic button and said, stop, <laughs> that's not your job. <laughs> Do you remember what happened during that box recon oh, yeah, before absolutely. you got shot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, again, you know, there's about 400 yards of open ground, no cover, no terrain, you know, nothing to hide behind between, you know, our position and their position. So, you know, again, you know, getting briefed by this, getting briefed by this by our, uh, um, you know, platoon commander, you know, he, he was just like, hey, guys, this is this. You can tell a look on his face. He's like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever had you guys do, but you're going to do it because you have to. He didn't say that, but that was just kind of like the look on his face. He goes, all right, you guys are going to leave here, walk into the city, go five blocks up, five blocks over and get out. And I just started laughing. I just, I just started laughing. I go, well, good knowing you boys. And our platoon commander just said, don't do that right now, please. You know? <laughs> so, you know, we, we started walking towards the city and, you know, um, again, you know, my mentality was always, you know, I'm a cowboy in Indian country. So, you know, I just kind of accept whatever happens. So, you know, I just kind of, how I process is I take it one step at a time. So step one was get across 400 yards of open terrain where I could be snipered RPG and I got no 
no cover. Somebody could have opened up on us with, uh, you know, RPD of even and just tore us to shreds. There's really nothing I could do. So my first, uh, my first goal was just to get into the city. So, you know, got into the city. We're still alive. Nobody shot at us. All right. Next goal, go five blocks up. So, you know, we just started going five blocks up, you know, people are looking at us like, you guys got balls, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the military age men just staring at us. Like, I, have you ever seen band of brothers where, uh, you know, Lieutenant Spears runs across the Germans mm -hmm. and they're like dumbfounded that this guy has the audacity to do that. That's kind of like the looks we're getting like, huh? <laughs> you, no kidding. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. Then we go, kind of like uh you know the five blocks up and then there's like all these kids around us like you know doing like the bang bang you know making gun fingers and going bang 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 and then we went five blocks over the kids are gone you know i remember watching this guy come out of the house with his wife and like four kids and he is just like sweating bullets like he's just like like he's just like like petrified and i i waved at him and said hey shakron he goes Chacron, <laughs> I tailed it out there with his with his with his kids, and I was just like, "Oh my god, this is going to be horrible," because that's the first thing you learn going on patrol in the city is watch the kids. Because mm -hmm. once the kids are taken out, you know, like once they kids are removed from the situation, that's when they hit you. You know, if you're surrounded by kids, they're not they're not going to fire on you because you know the, the kids are there. You know, they're all locals; they don't want to hurt the children. But as soon as the kids get taken out of the equation, it's game on. So. You know, all the kids are gone. I'm watching people get their families out of there. So, you know, we went five blocks over again, going back to my mentality, one step at a time. Like, all right, we made it five blocks out. All we got to do is five blocks out back to the, you know, back to our place. We're good guys, you know. So, you know, then all of a sudden, it's just all hell broke loose. Like, you know, so kind of what, what they teach you is don't ever be in the middle of the road. Well, that's what you learn, really. So the middle of the road, you don't have any cover. You know, so you want to be close to a building. You don't want to be right on the wall because as, you know, physics teaches you, you know, when a bullet hits the wall, it kind of like skirts the wall. So you want to be close to a building without being on the walls, but you do not want to be in the middle of the street because there's absolutely no cover. So we're kind of a staggered column, half of the squad on one half of the street, the other half on the other half of the street. And IEDs, you know, th those were always a big concern. So you're always looking for things that don't belong, you know, something out of place, wires leading into places they shouldn't, stuff like that. So, you know, we were probably only about not even a block and a half from leaving the city. And there was a rubble pile, you know, a pile of bricks. And right in the middle of that pile of bricks was a 10 box, you know, like a probably like a, you know, six by 10 inch 10 box that had no business being on a pile of bricks. So I see that and I'm thinking, that's a claymore. That somebody made a claymore. So, you know, now I'm faced with the dilemma of do I walk by the homemade claymore or do I walk into the middle of the street to avoid it? So I chose walking in the middle of the street to avoid the homemade claymore. And that's when they opened up on us. You know, it's gunfire everywhere. You know, when a bullet passes by you, it makes a crack as it breaks the sound barrier. That's how you know you're getting shot at. If you just if you hear the gunfire, you're fine. They're, you know you're, they're not shooting at you. But if you hear the cracks, that's when they know you're. And that's, I'm like in the middle of the street, and I hear crack, 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 crack. Like I'm being shot at. <laughs> so you know, that's like, well, here we go, boys. You know, so like with when you're getting shot at, you know, your instincts take over. You're not thinking. You know, you're you're just trying to you know take care of yourself. So I just start running like. You know, I got my flak jacket, you know, my gear, I got my helmet, got my rifle. And I'm just like running like Forrest Gump, just trying to get out of the middle of the street as they're shooting at me. And as I'm running, I see like impacts on the ground. You know, I see the dirt getting kicked up. I see like, uh, you know, impacts on the wall. Like there, there's somebody shooting directly at me. So I'm running and there's a like a wall, probably like um, waist high. And I was like, man, if I could just make it to that wall, I got a shot, right? Like, so I'm running for this wall. And I'm probably maybe like 10 feet away when, boom, I, I get shot right in the head. So it, it just like ragdolled me. I just went straight forward. You want me to start getting into this stuff or do you want to save this for later? All right. So, you know, I'm running for this wall. And if 
I knew I got shot in the head. Like it felt like somebody hit me in the head with a damn baseball bat. I mean, I heard the crack as it broke my helmet. You know what I mean? Like, so I thought initially that the bullet went in like, you know, sideways. I thought the bullet like went into my head, you know, like a kill shot, you know, like a coup de gras. So, you know, my body went ragdolled. I'd landed on that wall I was running for like face first. So now I'm just kind of like pressed up against the wall with my face, like leaning on it. I'm just kind of like ragdolled there, you know, and in my head, I'm thinking, well, this is it. I'm dead. You know, so it's kind of weird. Like they say thought moves at like 120 miles per hour or something like that. So, you know, when they say things slow down in situations like that, that's what they're talking about. Your thoughts are moving faster than your body. So, you know, this is all happening in the span of like three seconds, you know? So I'm sitting here with my rag doll, with my face pressed against this as well. I'm dead. I'm just literally just laying there waiting to stop breathing, you know, the, and then I realize I'm still breathing and that's like, well, self, you're still breathing. So you're not dead, but you're going to be, unless you get back into this fight. So I kind of like push myself off this, you know, into like, sort of like a kneeling position and you know everything's spinning like i'm in a washing machine everything's just going around in circles you know i, I can't see straight and i just kind of like lean myself up against this wall and uh you know you know i, I have the acog and i i was able to somehow focus myself like i was able just to like will the spinning to stop just enough to where i could raise my acog and uh, there was a guy probably like maybe 200 feet on top of a building, you know, had a one of those red uh, red rags, you know, the what, what's the proper term? Shamash? I, I don't Shemash. know. What Shemash. Yeah. yeah. He had one of those around his neck. You know, he couldn't have been much more than 16. You know, it's, it's on his face, that sort of thing. You know, so I put the ACOG on him and he's just big smile on his face, reloading his Kalashnikov. And I just put the crosshairs on him and just bop, 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 three rounds and he just drops. And then that was it. That's all I had. Like, I couldn't I couldn't keep my focus anymore. Like, everything was just spinning around in circles. You know, I couldn't see straight. It was sort of like being on a roller coaster at Six Flags, you know, like the, the corkscrews and everything. I couldn't do anything. So I just laid on the ground. So, you know, my, my thinking was, you know, yeah, well, I'll just play dead. Hopefully they don't shoot up my body as I lay here. So I'm just laying there on the ground. You know, I can't see straight. I don't know. I can't even crawl because, you know, if I start crawling, maybe I'm crawling towards the enemy. I don't know. You know, I don't know where my guys are at. I don't know where they're at. I can't see straight. And so I'm just laying there on the ground. And then it occurs to me like, well, this is probably it, guy. You know, you had a good run, Brad, but, you know, you're shot in the head in the middle of the street. You know, you don't know where to go. So, you know, I was a team leader, so I had a grenade. I had that said, fuck Iraq on it. You know, so I've seen enough videos of dudes getting their cut off, heads cut off on the Internet to know that that weren't for me. So I pulled a grenade out and I have the pin pulled. And I'm just laying there. I'm just like, I'm just going to frag whoever comes to get me. And all of a sudden we had a, we called them uh, ISRs, inter-squad radios. You know, so I had an inner squad radio and then all of a sudden I, I can hear like people talking and then it's my squad. So I'm sitting here with kind of ragdolled against this wall, you know, with this grenade in my hand with the pin pulled. And I was like, let's give these guys a shot. Maybe they can help me out. And I was, I was like, they're going back and forth, like, you know, calling out targets, stuff like that. And I was, break, break, break. Uh, we all had like code names, you know, like little pirate code names we gave each other. Mine was Roscoe you know, long story. So I was like, break, break, break. This is Roscoe. I'm shot in the head. I need help. I say again, I'm shot in the head. I need help. And I just laid there with my grenade. Like, are they going to respond? And then all of a sudden I just hear my uh, Madrigal, you know, he's a squad leader and my friend. He's like, Oh shit. Simmons is alive. We got to go get him. I was like, all right. So I just put the pin back in the grenade. I was like, all right, we got a shot at getting out of this one. Brad, let's, let's see how this plays out. You know, so I'm laying there and this is the funniest part of as funny as you can get with this story. So our corpsman, his name was uh, Mike Meany. We called him nasty Nate from the uh, movie half baked. You know, he loved that movie. We called him nasty Nate. Anyway, so I'm, 
I'm leaning against this wall and I just hear, I just hear, uh, you know, nasty Nate's voice. He's like, Hey, Hey, can you move? No. Are you sure? Can you, can you crawl to me? Nope. Pretty like, you're sure. Pretty sure, Nate. And then he just, I just hear him go, ah, okay. And he runs, you know, just kind of like, I guess I have to do this. And he just ran across the street and gunfire, you know, just open gunfire. You know, he grabs my M16, unclips it, and he just starts laying down cover fire. And he picks me up and he kind of guides me back to where the squad was, you know. So, yeah, he just like, and I was like, give me my gun back. Just tell me where to shoot. He's like, shut up and just come with me. <laughs> so we, we get back to my, uh, you know, where the rest of my squad is. They found like a, a wall of their own. And, you know, they, we had two saws going on top. And then we had, uh, you know, uh, a guy like shooting, you know, trying to pick out targets, you know, one of the other team leaders and this and that. And, you know, those, you know I'm just laying there. Like I, my vision starting to come back a little bit not enough to where i can really like be effective but kind of know what's going on and you know at this point my goal is just to stay calm like you know morale is contagious you know panic is contagious we don't need to panic right now and you know having me freaking out is not helping anything so my whole goal at this point of this story is just to sit here and be calm you know just let them do their thing so i'm just sitting here and I'm looking around at, you know, everybody's face and they're just terrified. Every, you know, keep in mind, we're, we're Marines, but we're all like 21, 22, 23, you know, we're, we're young people. And, uh, you know, we're just, I'm just seeing like just the panic and, you know, the, you know, the despair on everybody's face. And I was just like, I didn't know I could do nothing else I can do. So I just started screaming. I started screaming at the enemy. You know, I, I don't have a gun. I don't have any. I just started screaming like you cocksuckers will fucking kill every single one of you. Like, I'm just screaming at them, you know, for no other reason than that's the only thing I can think of to do to kind of, like, boost morale. Because I'm looking at these guys are looking at me with my head bleeding, you know, and they're just, like, freaked out. You know, here I am, one of the, you know, NCOs. I wasn't NCO yet. I was Lance Corporal. But one of the team leaders, you know, with, you know, blood coming out of my head in the middle of uh, Indian country. And I was like, they're, they're, they're not doing good. So I just started screaming. I was, and you know cathartically it was very very therapeutic you know <laughs> makes you feel a lot better to scream at the enemy so you know so the uh, kind of morale boosted a little bit and then uh that's when the tank came in you know all of a sudden a m1 abrams like almost ran us over to go down the street to start like laying down cover for us that's happened to me like three times and it's scary as shit every time it happens so you know they picked me up and now they're kind of like buddy carrying me to uh you know to the back to the railroad tracks and were you still in this in in the city limits yeah yeah this was before they uh you know they carried us back so right before they carried us back like uh you know nat you know the corpsman nate uh mike beanie he was kind of prepping me for move you know kind of putting a bandage on my head and what what happened was you know most of us carried personal sidearms which we weren't allowed to but we did anyway you know, so I had a, a, you know, Springfield 1911, you know, tucked in my waistband. And I knew if I got caught with that at some hospital, it would not be good. So he's prepping me. And I was like, hey, Mike, do me a favor. So I whip out the 1911, like, hide this for me. He's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he's like, dude, what, what is wrong with you? You know, so here I am, you know, shot in the head and, you know, getting prepped to move. And this guy's lecturing me on, you know, being stupid. <laughs> so, you know, we... Yeah, so he, he takes he takes that and uh, statute of limitations. I'm not worried about it. You know, it's been more than seven years. So you know, he, they evac me back to the uh, uh, company area and you know prepped me to put me in the ambulance. And again, you know, I got I got no weapon. You know, I got nothing. You know, I'm just bad as shit. So you know, screaming at the enemy and uh, our platoon commander from uh, the invasion. He was now a uh, first lieutenant and he was the XO for weapons company. Like he happened to be in an area and he'd come over just to, he heard I was shot. He just came over to see me before I got back. And I looked at him and he was just like, Oh my God. And I just remember saying, don't take no shit from those goddamn Hodges. And he just kind of gave me a thumbs up. Like 
sure, pal. <laughs> Whatever you say. And then they, they medevaced me back to, uh, you know, the hospital. And I was, it took me about two weeks uh, to convince, uh, you know, everybody to let me go back to the city, but I finally did. But yeah, it was, it was funny. Like, you know, my, the meal I had before we went on that patrol was a uh, cheeseburger MRE. So that was in my stomach, you know, the cheeseburger MRE. And uh, I puked it up on the way to the hospital. It took me 10 years before I could eat cheeseburgers. Cause every time I ate cheeseburgers, it just reminded me of, you know, that situation. And then, you know, it's, we're, and it, this is hilarious. So it's just, you know, going back to bureaucracy of the Marine Corps. So the, uh, the hospital was on the main base. So I'm in the ambulance. They're trying to take me to uh, uh, the triage area. And uh, they have like a speed limit of five miles an hour on the base. So, you know, we're, we're booking it, trying to get this guy that shot in the head to the hospital at like 30, 40 miles an hour. And the whole time I'm in this ambulance, you know, I just hear people, slow down, speed limit's five miles an hour. I'm just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we're clearly in an ambulance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is nonsense. But yeah, yeah, it was so, I mean, you, it, when you get in these situations, you try to pick out the funny bits. You don't want to dwell on, you know, the, the hardships. You try to pick out the funny bits. So, like, uh, you know, I got to the hospital and, uh, you know, I was pretty salty. I was I was not a happy camper, you know, you know, got shot, you know, pretty amped up. My boys are still in the uh, my boys are still in the, uh, you know, the city fighting. My boys are still in the city fighting. So, you know, I'm laying there in the bed. And, uh, you know, they just got done stitching me up and, uh, the, uh, Sergeant major of the Marine Corps and the commandant of the Marine Corps were there. Like they were like glad handing people, you know, there was probably like three or four people in the, uh, recovery room and they came in like glad handing people and, you know, with the camera crew and everything. And all I could think of is, you know, somebody's going to take a picture of me in a hospital bed and my grandma who subscribes to the Marine Corps Times is going to see your grandson, like jacked up in a hospital bed, you know? So I just, uh, start screaming at the Marine, you know, commandant of the Marine Corps, you keep that effing camera away from me. You hear me? And everybody just like looks at me like, who, what? <laughs> <laughs> and the Sergeant major of the Marine Corps comes over and he like shakes my hand. Like he's going to break my hand. He's whispering like, you listen to me, devil dog. I need you to shut your goddamn mouth right now. That's the commandant of the Marine Corps. You motherfucker. And then the camera snaps and then he smiles. I'm just sitting there just like all pissed off. And then he kind of shoves a, you know, challenge coin in my hand. He's like, listen, to what I'm saying, you need to chill out. Okay. Devil dog. I know you're a war fighter, but chill the fuck out. And then he like walks away and I was just like, yeah, I need to shut my mouth, you know, <laughs> but then they, you know, it, it wasn't, I mean, it sounds horrible, you know, the shot in the head thing, but it really wasn't that bad. I mean, it's just a flesh wound. I got extremely lucky, but, uh, you know, it caused vertigo and stuff like that. So that, that was the majority of my problems getting my vertigo under control. But like, so when they checked me into the hospital, they, they asked you, you know, do you want us to call your family? And I was like, no, you know, I don't want anybody to call him, but me, I don't want my dad to get some random phone call that his son was shot in the head in Iraq. That's something I wanted to hear from me. So, you know, they, I spent three days in the hospital and they moved me across the street to like a uh, battalion aid station waiting for a ride back to my unit. And uh, there was a corpsman there who says, hey, did you get a phone call home? I was like, no. She's like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. So she gets me a DSN line and she, I'm able to call home, you know, for the first time and I get a hold of my dad. And I was like, hey, dad, I'm fine. I don't want you to panic, but I have been shot in the head. And I just hear, I know somebody called me three days ago and then they hung up the phone. I was like, what? So apparently somebody called him and said, yeah, this is so-and-so with, uh, you know, the Marine Corps. I just want to let you know your son's been shot in the head in, in combat. Oh, I'm not supposed to talk to you. And then hung up the phone. And I was just like, so for three days, you know, my dad is just like calling anyone. He's calling like congressmen. He's calling recruiters. He's calling rep. Anybody you can think of might give me some information on me. You know, and finally I get a hold of him and he's just like, you know, he's all pissed off. And I, I am too. So when they took me to the hospital, they cut off my uniform. And, you know, all I have is like, you know, a pair of uh, silky PT shorts and combat boots. That's literally all I have. I don't even have a t-shirt. And they gave me an IV to, you know, hydrate me. So 
I hung up the phone. I took my IV pole and walked across the street to the hospital in my silky shorts and my boots. And I just started screaming, like, which one of you stupid bastards called my dad? Like, who are you? Like, never mind who I am. Like, <laughs> They sent me back. To, like, get out of your idiot. They sent me back to the, the aid station. But yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I went back. Uh, the, the rumor was I was dead. Like, you know, my company, uh, you know, the battalion, the rumor was I was dead. Like nobody knew anything. So, you know, I, all the uh, all my company, all my friends, they were in the city fighting. So they, they got a ride back to my uh, uh, my base, which was pretty much abandoned except for, you know, um, you know, guard, you know, cooks, you know, cooks, they put on guard, things like that. So I didn't know what to do. So I just like, I just had to check in at a battalion aid station, like once a day, just to let them know I was alive, which was on the other side of the base, which was fun to walk when you have vertigo, you know? So all of a sudden the door, like, I think it was like three or four days later, the door opens and it's like guys from my uh, squad that they're rotating back to get showers and stuff. Like, Oh my God, he's not dead. He's here. Like, the rumors aren't true. <laughs> they, they had no idea. They, they, everybody thought I was a goner. So, how long were you uh, were you out of circulation for? About two weeks. Um, two weeks and some change. You know, they they people were trying to talk me into going to Germany, and I was like, no, I'm not going to Germany. You know, this is where I, my squad is. This is where my my friends are. I'm staying here. And they tried to talk me into like taking a deferral to go back to my home in St. Louis. I was like. I'm not taking it. I'm going, I'm going back. And they, you know, trying to get me to take like uh, some job at the main base of Fallujah, you know, take you out of action. You'll, you'll still be in countries. Like, I don't think you guys understand me. I'm going back in the city. You know, as soon as I find a doctor to sign my piece of paper saying I'm fit for combat, I'm going back in like this. That's just the way it is. Get used to it. Finally, after like two weeks of me badgering the doc, you know, the doctor, he finally signed my piece of paper out of frustration and let me back in. But I was only, you know, that's again, the political climate was, uh, you know, stop the advance. So, you know, we, we were just kind of sitting in the city anyway, we weren't really doing much. I was there for like two more days and they, we pulled back to the surrounding Ambar area, Ambar province, but we weren't allowed in the city um, after we got out of uh, Fallujah. After we got out of Fallujah, our mission turned towards uh, road security. So we did a lot of, uh, you know, road operations. And there were some pretty spicy areas around there. Uh, I call it the suburbs. You know, so you'd have these uh, stretch of, uh, you know, five to ten city blocks of just like homes and whatnot that insurgents were attacking uh, the convoys and they disappeared. So we we had plenty of plenty of operations out there. Do you still feel any effects from the head wound? As far as like physical, like vertigo, mm -hmm. that what you mean? oh yeah, yeah, it's, that it's gotten better over time. Like uh, they call it benign positional vertigo. So if I turn my head a certain way, you know, it's like I'm in a washing machine again. So I just learned not to turn my head that way. You know, on the rare occasion that I forget and I turn my head, it used to be like you know a good two minutes of uh, you know rocking and rolling, but now if I do it, it's probably like ten, like ten to thirty seconds. So it's it's not terrible. So where what happened uh, with the projectile? Did, did you ever figure out? Uh, obviously, it went through your helmet. Your helmet probably saved your life, right? No, absolutely not. Um, again, I was running like Forrest Gump. Like I was kind of head down, just kind of like a turtle chucking it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it impacted, you know, my bare, uh, you know, skin, you know, to the right of my spine, about three inches. And then it exited. And when it exited, it uh, went through my helmet. I still have it, you know, Sif let me keep it. Those wonderful people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can keep that. I was like, really? You know, you guys don't want it back? I'm like, no, we're good, bro. <laughs> Get the right off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's an exit wound on that helmet, but there's no entrance wound. So it's just, I just, I got, there is a pretty cool scar tunnel in my head. So they did an, like years later after I got out of the Marine, they did an MRI on my head for, uh, something unrelated and he goes, what is this line in your head like what what is it like well that would be a bullet wound he's like shut up like it is i swear to god like like i'll i got the metal at home to prove it you know <laughs> he's like okay well you know that's probably not great for your head and like no kidding <laughs> eight years of medical school you know 
thank you. you know? <laughs> what other times were you engaged in heavy combat like that? Uh, well, again, going back to, you know, in March, when we first got there, um, our uh, battalion commander was trying to make a point, you know, to say leaders that we were not, you know, the army, our mission, our scope of our mission was not their scope of mission. You know, we're going to go in the city anytime we want to. So, you know, we had like a 10 hour patrol, like, uh, you know, they had the whole, uh, battalion mount up and they broke us down by squads and they said, all right, squad, this is your 10 blocks. And literally for 10 hours, we just walked in circles in this like 10 to 15 block radius, just, just to prove to, uh, you know, the locals that we can shut down the city anytime we want. So that got pretty spicy, uh, you know, 10 hours of just people taking pop shots at you every now and then you'd get into like an actual shoot them up. But, you know, with that many of us in the city, you know, my squads in my 10 block radius, you know, if we got kind of pinned down, we just had the squad adjacent to us kind of come in and flake them. So that, that, you know, we were there for 10 hours. I'd say the first, like first, like three hours was pretty spicy. And then after that, they just kind of realized like this, we're not really doing anything, but that, that whole situation was annoying because, uh, you know, each squad had, uh, you know, a leader attached to it. So like, one squad had the baton, uh, had the uh, platoon commander. One squad had the uh, platoon guide, you know, and we had the platoon sergeant. Uh, platoon sergeant was, uh, you know, a recruiter. So when we were in, he was there to make, he was there to earn medals. Long story short. So while we were in uh, uh, the invasion of Iraq, he was recruiting, which is fine. But, you know, he came in with this big chip on his shoulder that, you know, we all have seen combat, have the combat action route, and he didn't. So. You know, he started that deployment just wanting to win medals. And he just kept putting my squad in these, like, terrible situations. It's just, like, just begging for us to get ambushed just so that he can, you know, get into a firefight and get his baptized, baptism by fire or something like that. It was, it was just insane. I, I, I just got so tired of tired of that that day. Like, just stupid stuff. Like, we're patrolling and we came across this uh, courtyard. And it was like a kind of like a nicer neighborhood and it had a decorative fountain in the middle and you know these decent homes but all the houses were like you know three four stories and we're in this courtyard with no no cover all guys got to do is just get on those you know three four stories and we're shooting fish in a barrel right so we roll into this courtyard and uh you know i was just like hey we need to get out of here immediately and then this uh you know the staff sergeant says no no we're gonna stay here a little bit I was like, Whoa, what? Are you crazy? You know, like, like this is this is us getting killed situation. We like, no, we're gonna we're gonna stick around. So, you know, me and my squad, you know, me and my, my squad are just sitting here just like watching the rooftops, you know, trying to not die. And this guy's like playing soccer with kids and you know, bullshitting with the locals. And I was just like, Oh my god. And again, going back to the kids, you know, as long as the kids were in the courtyard, you know, we knew we were safe, you know, but it would we're watching the kids and all of a sudden this uh, man comes out, trying to get the kids out of the courtyard. And I, I stopped him. I was like, no, these kids are staying right here. You know, I was like, it's, they're, these kids aren't going anywhere. You know, this, this goes back to like the ethics of, you know, war, unfortunately, is this like, we had an interpreter we called Sammy because he was from the Sudan and he looked like Sammy Dave jr. And I called him over like, Sammy, tell this guy, if he throws his, if he takes his, uh, kids out of this courtyard i'm throwing a grenade in his house and he just looked at me like i was the devil himself i mean it was a bluff i'm not going to do it but uh, i was i needed those kids to stay in that courtyard so that you know we don't get killed so then after like 20 minutes you know finally the platoon started like oh we're going to see any action here and then we continue on with the patrols it's like this guy I mean, he's, you need to stop this dude <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it was, it was crazy like the other one was uh, again that same day I turned a corner. My team was on the point in the, you know, the patrol and we turned this corner and I'm staring at like probably 50 to 60 military age men, like all grouped together in the street, you know, with a dude on a board, you know, so whenever somebody, whenever one of them gets killed, they have to bury them that same day. And kind of like the ritual is they hoist them up on like a board door or whatever. And they kind of like give them a send off, you know, screaming and hollering into the, the, graveyard whatever 
So I turn this corner and I'm, I'm sitting there staring at like all these military dudes with one of their buddies on a board that we probably killed this morning. I was like, Oh no. So I, I go back to, you know, my buddy, the squad leader. I was like, Hey man, there's like 50, 60 dudes up here. It's not good. We're just going to bump like two blocks up and come over in this staff sergeant. He goes, no, we're going to patrol right through them. It's like, when we both look at him, like, what are you talking about? And he says something crazy. Like sometimes you need to take the bull by the horns. So it's like, there's, there's 10 of us, you know, like, and he wants to stagger column through these like 60 dudes. <laughs> like, are you stupid? But it's just, you, you got to follow orders. Like, all right. You know, so I take point and, uh, you know, again, I got my, my grenade and I hold a pen and I'm just like walking through the crowd with like this grenade pulled showing like, yeah, you want some, you, you, how about you, you want some? And they just like parted. Like they don't want no part of that. They just like spread out. And as we get through that group and I was like the last, you know, I was kind of like counting bodies, you know, to make sure nobody got snatched as we move through. And I, I counted all 10 of us and I just put the pin back in. And as soon as we started walking away, all 60 of these guys are just like screaming and chanting and, you know, carrying their buddy off. And I was just like, I'm looking at the rooftops. There's guys on the rooftops with AKs. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this guy's going to get me killed. You know, like, and I, I went, Oh, it was like, you know, I don't want to get into too much of the bush with that, but that's like an example of terrible leadership. You know, he was there for all the wrong reasons. They, they, they bust him out. They, like we got back and, you know, they, they reassigned him real quick, but it was just, that was just kind of nonsense you ran into a lot was just guys just trying to do stupid stuff to win medals and whatnot. It's like, settle down, you know? Good grief. Yeah. It's just the way it was. So, you know, that was before the contractor incident, you know, again, mm. You know, you know, the, the city kind of like had felt felt like that, you know, the U.S. military couldn't do anything. That's just kind of like how they, they felt. You know, that was kind of the, you know, what we got from our interpreters that were telling us, you know, that was kind of what we got from, uh, uh, you know, our leadership is, you know, that they feel like, you know, we're we're nothing to them. Like they don't care about us. So, you know, we were making aggressive moves to kind of make the point that, you know, don't mess with us. And again, escalation, you know, it's not like they're like, oh, yeah, you're, you guys are the big dogs and they start backing down. They start escalating and then we escalate and they escalate, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle. So that that 10 hour patrol would have been uh, uh, March and then uh, early April. That's when I got shot. And then, you know, we were there till October. So the rest of my combat in that area was all in the uh, suburbs, you know, Ambar province, you know, little towns here, there, just kind of like the weirdness of the area, you know, how desensitized you get to the whole thing. You know, it's just like, like kind of an off color story, but, uh, you know, there was one, uh, uh, suburb, you know, I don't know what else to call it where they were ambushing us all the time. So we assaulted the suburb, you know, so you, you had like, uh, the suburb and then probably like five or six blocks, and then open farmland and then date palms and stuff like that. So our goal was kind of like to push them to the, the farmland to where they had nowhere else to go and then, you know, take them down that way. So we just kind of like moved through the suburbs forward. And then they, you know, there was like one two story building in the middle of the farmland. I don't know what it was for. And they, you know, probably like six or seven guys like ran from the suburbs into that building. And then, you know, They've got a good spot there for the most part, you know, good field to fire, you know, you know, but we had a tank. We had an, <laughs> we had an Abrams. So <laughs> Abrams trumps good field to fire, you know, so we called the Abrams up and, uh, you know, he took one shot at that two story building and uh, knocked off, you know, half of it. So, you know, going back to, you know, the point I'm making is desensitization, you know, so we, we go to check out the blown up building that we just destroyed with a tank and, my uh, my team was on uh, security on the outside, so I'm taking a knee and I look over and there's a, a head, you know, some dude's head there, and uh, you know his face was perfect, but the back half of his head was like uh, the skin was removed, so you see skull, and he's just sitting there, and he's just staring at me. It's like I'm looking at it, and I was like, man, I don't want that guy staring at me, so I just kind of take my rifle muzzle and just kind of push it so that he stares that way. You're like, yeah, that's better. You know, <laughs> you know, this is, 
it's just kind of like your thought process is like, oh man, I don't want that. That's gross. Like, <laughs> look over there. <laughs> but you know, and that would have that would have been that probably would have been May. You know, so I got there in March, and by May, I'm just so desensitized that that's kind of that sort of thing doesn't even bother me anymore. It's just like, ah. I mean, was there a lot that happened in between that? By yeah. the time you left in that. Oh yeah, yeah. It was, it was always it was always pretty spicy. I mean, it didn't, never really trailed off. I mean, you know, IEDs. I mean, IEDs were the big thing. You know, you I, you get blown up like every patrol IED went off. Now, that's not an exaggeration. We used to do um, so. We had one up armor our uh, Humvee. All our Humvees were like had just had like half inch plate steel bolted to the side. We didn't have any up armor, right? The army had up armors and we stole one. Again, Marines are thieves, you know, up at uh, Camp Fallujah, they had rows of up armor, you know, tan up armors that was there for some reason, we weren't allowed to have them. So our gunnery sergeant for the, uh, you know, company gunnery sergeant, he put six of us in a Humvee and we drove up there. He's like, just steal them, take them. So we stole like six up armor Humvees from uh, the, the motor pool in the uh, Camp Fallujah. And each company, uh, each, excuse me, each platoon got one up armor, it, but it was tan. Our Humvees were green. So this is how we used them. We called it the El Presidente. So we'd go out on patrol with three green ones and the tan up armor. And we put like little flags on the antenna. So it looks like the president or somebody, like somebody important is driving that one. And we only put one guy in there, the driver. So if they were going to clack one of us, they were going to clack the, the El Presidente. And we always made the lieutenant drive the El Presidente. So <laughs> he was a good sport. He didn't mind. <laughs> so, you know, you know, this this was early in the insurgency. They hadn't gotten into shape charges yet. So pretty much the IEDs were uh, 155 shells, like hot wire. So when they blew, they just blew up, you know, so you could, there was a pretty good chance you were going to survive unless you're right on top of them. So, you know, they, they clacked the uh, El Presidente and then, you know, we get into like, that was usually the start of an ambush you know they'd set off an ied and then they tried to hit us up with like uh you know belt feds or you know whatever they had then they'd run away phosphorus those were dangerous you know they had some phosphorus uh 105s so when you got hit with that that really screwed you up our first sergeant got hit in the face with that and that son of a bitch looked like the terminator after uh you know sarah connor got done with him uh his name was you know i'll give a shout out to him steve fantal he's a fantastic dude I, to this day if he called me and asked me to do anything. I'd like, yeah, Steve, where do you need me? Philly? No problem. You know, <laughs> you know, but yeah, he, uh, he caught one of those in the face and man, it was, that was like the, probably the biggest fear is just getting clacked by a phosphorus 155 because, you know, you'll survive, but you're not going to be the same after that. Mm -hmm. And I saw a couple of dudes get hit by those things. Yeah, they started getting real nasty with it towards the end there. Like uh, they started packing uh, the one five fives with like saw blades, nuts, bolts, things like that to really, really make them you know pretty spicy. Like a uh, dude named Chris Ebert, he got a uh, you know he got clacked by one of those, and man, I didn't even recognize that dude. You know, he died. You know, his, his face was just man, it looked I can't it looked like play doh. It was nuts. You know, so it's like. Once they started figuring out, you know, escalation, we do something, they do something in response. Uh, you know, once they started packing them with, uh, you know, saw blades, things like that, it got pretty dangerous. Started using phosphorus a little bit more. Then they started shaping them. You know, they'd, they'd start putting like uh, metal plates in front of them and then they'd set them off so that the metal plate kind of like shoots across and, you know, takes things out. So they, they hit a couple of uh, non up armor hub knees with those and they just decimated them. They were, they look like, you know, burnt out matchbox. Like you, you can't even like describe that. <laughs> like once you, you roll up to a scene, you know, and you see a Humvee like that, like, oh no, <laughs> is everybody okay? Yeah, we're fine. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> we all have to come home at some point. So obviously you made it home and you know, thankfully you made yeah. it home. And in, uh, in one piece, might I add, um, with all of your digits, has any of this affected you in the long term? And tell me if I'm going too far. I'm, no, I'm, that's I, fine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you don't walk away from, you know, those 
situations on unscathed. You know, when it, we went to a, Iraq the first time on a ship, you know, so when we left Iraq, we had, you know, two, two and a half months of like decompression time. I mean, you weren't the same, but, you know, you weren't on on high alert like you were in Iraq. You, know, you had time to kind of adjust and, you know, Fallujah, you know, there was no adjustment time. You know, we got on a plane, you know, so one day we're on patrol getting blown up, shot at, whatever. A week later, I'm in a, you know, convenience store buying a Coca-Cola, you know, <laughs> you know, you're still, you, you didn't really have too much uh, time to decompress. Like, I remember I got back in the, me and a friend of mine went to a bar to go shoot pool and uh, somebody revved up their motorcycle, you know, like a Harley with the big pipes. We jumped under the table. Like we... We just jumped out of the table, scared as shit. Everybody's staring at us like, what's wrong with these guys? You know, we kind of like dusted ourselves off. Like, my bad, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You yeah, know, there's, there's actually there's actually books. Like, there's a there's a book called um, Achilles in Vietnam, um, a, a pretty classic uh, book uh, that, that studies some of the uh, post-traumatic stress uh, and, and some of the effects that post-traumatic stress has had on people. And, and they compare... Uh, soldiers in Vietnam who went through a traumatic uh, event and and compare them to some of the warriors in that were described in um, in Achilles in in, in the the Iliad. Iliad and yeah. um, one of the interesting points that was made is actually something you touched on because uh, they were talking about in World War II the soldiers actually readjusted much better because they had to ride a boat home and they were stuck with everybody in their unit on the way home and so the men were able to converse with each other process what they saw you know help each other in the long term once they once they ported back in new york and uh, get back on with civilian life with that period of time on the on the vessel to where they would uh, they would work through a lot of the uh, a lot of the stresses uh, whereas in vietnam of course, they were towards the end of it, especially they were doing single person replacements. People were just getting flown in and out of country. You didn't really have a good bond with your unit. And within 12, 24 hours, you were back stateside doing whatever. And on the flip side of it, within 12, 24 hours, you were in Vietnam, in country, and then dropped into uh, potentially a, a combat situation. And they were talking about the increase of um of post-traumatic stress that came from the lack of decompression time with the unit with the men who experienced traumatic events uh, together with uh, other people in the unit and it, it's interesting it's just that's just an off comment to to add to what you just described because that is a perfect that is perfectly exactly what they uh, what they talked about is that some of those guys um in world war ii uh, seem to have less of an issue because they were with their units a lot longer on, on the return. I mean, my theory has always been, you know, you, I, I've talked to, uh, you know, World War II vets, you know, Army and Marines, you know, uh, both theaters. I've talked to uh, Korean War vets, uh, you know, you know, I've talked to Vietnam vets, you know, and, and, and what my personal, you know, experience, you know, talking to these guys and they talk about their you know, experiences and, you know, adjustments is, you know, kind of like the validity of, of, you know, their missions, you know, so like the World War II guys, especially, you know, they, they felt like they were fighting the good fight and, you know, they had clear objectives, you know, we just had to take, uh, you know, X and then we can go home, you know, uh, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, the Korean vets, you know, they had some of that, you know, too, they, we just have to push them across the 38th parallel, we can go home, no big deal. You know, we're saving the world from communism. And then, you know, the Vietnam guys, you know, that's where the sort of my opinion started to trail off is, you know, they're going on patrols that, you know, really, really didn't have anything, any kind of objective is just kind of go out there, ambush patrol, come back, you know. And that's kind of what I, I experienced personally, especially in Fallujah. We'd go on these mounted patrols to drive around in circles no clear objective we're not trying to take anything we're not trying to really do anything other than drive around in circles and not get sapped that day so you know the, that that gets hard to process too you know the whole you know you know 
you, you do a difficult thing, but you're doing a difficult thing for a reason. You know, we're doing difficult and hard and morally questionable things, but we really don't have any, you know, not to get too off in the weeds, and we really don't have anything tangible that we can say we did. You know, we we didn't we didn't pacify the city. You know, we didn't make life better for Iraqis. You know, we we didn't pave the way for democracy. You know, we we really just kind of like drove in with our Humvees and started some crap, and then all right, seven months is up. Let's go, boys. And you know, so you're going home with the uh, you know the realizations of some of the things you saw, some of the things you did, and you know, you made the asking those questions like, what the hell did we do it for? It just makes it ten times worse. You know, it's, you know, it's just, you just like, why why the hell did I why the hell did we do this? You know, and I'm not putting the politics into it. I'm I, it's just the reality of it is, you know, you you know, I'm a moral human being. I was raised, you know, to believe right and wrong. And you're, you're put in these situations where you got to be kind of morally ambiguous and you can't even say it's, it's, you're doing it for, you know, a just and righteous cause. You're, you're just doing it just to stay alive. And that, that, that that's probably like the hardest thing to, you know, to reconcile with. And, you know, later days, you know, going back to the story, you know, I threatened to throw a grenade in the guy's house just to use his kids as a human shield just so I can go home that day. You know, that's that's not something a moral moral man does. You know, <laughs> that that's that's psychotic. You know, but again, that's what I had to do that day to to get me and my guys home. You know, so you look back on that in later years, like Jesus. You know, <laughs> so now that now that it's years uh, years have passed, how what goes through your mind when you recount uh, days like that? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of the, you know, I think they call it emergent therapy. You know, I went through counseling, things like that. And they just, you just they have you talk about it over and over and over again to kind of like desensitize it, you to it. And, you know, you know, every now and then, like, I'll just be driving. I'll start thinking about the days. Like, I got like a 30-minute drive to work, and I'll have like a two-minute cry session. And then it's just kind of like a black cloud. It just kind of, storm cloud just kind of hits me and then goes off, and then I go about my day. I mean, that's kind of level I'm at, you know, you know, the storm cloud used to, you know, the storm used to last like, you know, a day, and then it was a couple hours, and then now it's down to a couple minutes, but you just, it hits you, you got to ride the lightning, and then, you know, go about your day, or be an alcoholic, you know, <laughs> I say, say that jokingly, but those, that's the reality, you know, it's like, either deal with it, or you, you know, be that guy that's living under a bridge with a sign. You know, I, I didn't want to be that guy, so that's why I got counseling. I, maybe this is me being optimistic. I, I feel like more people are uh, open or more uh, veterans are open to seeking counseling, seeking help. Um, but part of it, I'm curious, do you, do you ever show up with a counselor who clearly you, you can tell has no idea he, what he and she, or he or she is doing with counseling? Um, yeah, I've been, I've had the experience. Well, I mean, and that, that kind of goes back to the combat veteran thing, you know, you know, it, it's hard, it's hard to relate with people that haven't been through that, you know, like going back to the head story, I tell that head story and people look at me like I'm in the freak show, you know, like I'm in a circus, you know, you know, it's like, oh my God, that's horrible. And, you know, you know, so a lot of not wanting to talk about that stuff is me, you know, my own personal experience is me wanting to be normal. You know, it doesn't feel normal when you tell these, you know, insane stories and people look at you like, you know, you're the bearded lady in the circus, you know, it's just not, you, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel normal, you know? So when you put that in a counseling situation where you walk into a, you know, a guy that's, got a master's degree in social work, you know, trying to be your counselor and you tell these stories and he's looking at you like, like, Oh my God, you know, like that's the whole most horrific thing I've ever seen or heard about, you know, it is kind of like that amplifies that freak show, <laughs> freak show feeling like even more. And you just, you don't want to do it. You know, he's like my first counselor, you know, he's a good guy. He was trying to help, but I tell him, you know, some of the, you know, more of my, some of my more spicy stories and he, you know, his jaw would drop and it, you catch that look and it's just like, oh man, I don't need that. Like, 
I don't need you sitting there, you know, looking at me like I'm Charles Manson right now. You know, that's that's not helpful, you know. So it, it's very difficult as a combat veteran, you know, in my opinion, just to talk to somebody, you know, to where they understand where you're coming from because they haven't been there. You know, they, they, they don't know what it's like, you know, be blown up every day. You know, they, they don't know what it's like to, you know, look down at your buddy that just got clacked and, you know, his face looks like Play-Doh, you know. You, you, and, and a lot of times it's hard to, you know, the more difficult days that I had, you know, from a moral perspective, it's hard to put that into context. You know, you know, it's hard to put into context why I threatened this guy family with a grenade, you know. Like, you know, the context is that the kids are keeping me safe. I need to keep the kids in the courtyard, otherwise I'm getting ambushed. But, you know, it's hard for somebody to bridge that gap between the consequences of not keeping those kids and the consequences of them leaving. And, you know, you need to do everything you can to keep those kids around you. You know, it makes you sound like a horrible human being. It does. Like, I, I get that, you know, and that's just, you know, tip of the iceberg for me, unfortunately. So, you know, to sit there and talk to a counselor about these horrific things and, you know, him just look at you with like, oh, you scumbag. <laughs> it makes it difficult to go into that guy's office every day. But, you know, fortunately, I did find a, you know, you know, a counselor that, you know, been through some stuff in NAM and he was able to relate to me a lot better. And I felt comfortable talking to him because he got it. But, you know, not everybody gets that. You know, not everybody's lucky enough to, you know, hit that wicket. You know, they, you know, they they try to talk to somebody and they either don't want to hear it or they, you know, come at them with like something they read out of a book, you know, or they give you a workbook, you know, and I'm sitting here talking to, you know, that, that guy I was talking about, I'm spilling my guts to him. He's like, well, here's a workbook. I want you to fill out pages like one through six and we'll discuss it next time. It's like, I wipe my ass with your workbook, dude. Like, I don't need this workbook. Like <laughs> I need somebody to tell me, you know, how to not, you know, how to live with this, you know, I got to go to work on Monday. I can't go to work on Monday if I'm crying my freaking eyes out. How can we, how can we make this stop? You know, and then, you know, on a more personal note, you know, like, you know, I, I couldn't even talk to my family. You know, like I remember I got back from uh, Fallujah. My dad met me in California, you know, he's a fantastic man, you know, raised me, you know, wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, we're sitting at Denny's and I, I try to tell him about some of the stuff that went on over there and he goes, Hey, what happened there needs to stay there. Okay. It just needs to stay there. Okay. Just, you're back. You don't, we don't need to do this. It's like, Roger that pops, you know, <laughs> like, I guess I'll just go ahead and just, uh, you know, put this in a ball and just put it down deep inside me. <laughs> but, you know, that's just kind of like the experience, you know, like you come back and you, you know, most people just can't handle what you're laying down. So I, I think what you're talking about, and uh, you know, this is this is not me playing counselor. This is me talking with enough guys who have been through um, uh, traumatic events and actually working with a lot of veteran organizations uh, with these things. But there's a there's a difference between uh, post traumatic stress and moral injury. And what you're talking about, wrestling with that moral injury, that that one day that you threatened to throw a grenade into some man's home yeah. for vacating some kids, that that is a moral injury because that's not what you would do on a normal day. Uh, but the circumstances were uh, extreme that led you to that situation. Uh, I, I'd imagine, especially since you have kids of your own, yeah, um, you probably think back at your kids if they were in that situation, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you just think like Jesus, like mm -hmm. the hell kind of person was I back in the day? That's by the way, that's that's the stuff that hits me the hardest. Or, or kids in in battlefields. I mean that that is the hardest image for me to see. It's weird that you you can see a grown man blown blown to bits and be desensitized, but more so when you see little kids that that has a different uh, imprint on, on your mind in the long term. Oh, yeah. Um, so I know there's a lot of guys out there who uh, who have probably gone through similar circumstances. And I know for certain there are a lot of men out there, men and women out there, who are still struggling with both the post-traumatic stress and also the moral injury out there. Um, you are one of the more well-adjusted 
uh, with the amount of uh, incidents that you experience. You're one of the more well-adjusted vets that I personally know. What would be your advice to some of those guys out there who are still trying to tackle this situation, who are still wrestling with a bottle or worse, wrestling with a handgun? Uh, reach out. That's about it. You know, just there's resource, you know, there's resources out there available. You know, there's Wounded Warrior Project. You know, there's call the VA. The VA can direct you to local resources. Like there's a counseling area, uh, place uh, that in this area that does a great job. And I found it through the VA. I called the VA and like, hey, I need, I need to go somewhere. You know, there's there's support groups out there. Just call your local church like, hey, I need to talk to somebody. What can I do? You know, there's, there's resources out there. You know, and you just got to want to, you just got to want to find it. You just got to want to reach for it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not only reaching for it, but you got to be willing to put in the work. It's work. It's not, you know, two sessions and voila, you're, you know, we're a well-adjusted human being. I mean, it takes years, years, you know, going back to the, uh, you know, emergent therapy, immersion therapy, you know, reliving it, talking it, you know, it just gets easier every time you talk about it, you know, just putting in that work, you know, finding something that, you know, if it's spiritual, you know, church, whatever, fine, you know, go find it. You know, for me, you know, I discovered Buddhism in Iraq for Christ's sakes, you know, like Fallujah. That's kind of what got me through some of my days was, you know, the teachings of Buddha. And I just kept running with it. You know, that that's what I held on to. Some guys hold on to, uh, you know, Christianity or Judaism or if that's what you need to, you know, get, you know, get the help you need. Don't be ashamed. You know, go to your church. Go to, you know, start Googling. You you, you can Google just about anything these days, you know. But mm-hmm. you know, the first step is you taking that step, you know, saying, I, I, I need to be better. Because I was an alcoholic, you know. First couple of years out, like, I was, I was terrible. Like, like I don't know how, how I made it, you know. I, was, I drank all the time, you know, it was college you know, booze everywhere, you know, I had to make that conscious decision of, uh, you know, no, no more and just start putting in the work to, you know, to get better. And it's rough. It's hard. You know, like I said, it's, it's hard. You know, your first instinct of survival is to, uh, you know, ignore, you know, these bad feelings, you know, the, the bad memories, you know, just don't think about it, but you, you gotta, you gotta dig down and, you got to air out that dirty laundry, you know, for lack of a better word. It's, there's no so, shortcuts. You know, people want to take a bunch of, you know, pills. They want to, you know, take this, that, you know, pharmaceuticals. That doesn't help. You, you got you got to go to the counseling. You got to you got to put in the work. You can't just mask it. There's actually the crisis line. Yeah, that veterans would call before it was some crazy number, but now it's a nine eight eight option one. So kind of like nine one one, but nine eight eight, and then option one directly puts you into veterans. And uh, and actually, I recently learned that even family members could call that number to uh, look for resources to help uh, veterans who are going through some of these uh, some of these life events that are. Um, that's left them with uh with long-term uh, long-term effects but um i i did want to at least reach this point because i do know that uh there's a potential of a lot of guys who have been through similar um, events still going through some of these lasting effects brad i, mean, I appreciate you uh, being a friend yeah no problem and talking about some of these things too so um, I hope that uh, years down the road, we'll we'll get to hear from more guys who have uh, been through some of those hard times and get to at least, you know, not necessarily relive, but learn about some of the hardships that were that were um, that were taken during the GWAT era. Um, but before we go, I did want to open the floor to you to see if you had anything to that you would want to, you know, talk about outside of just the the story of this. Or how can people reach you? I'm off Instagram until September, but when I get back on Instagram, I think it's like Christ. What is it? 
M26 lemon grenade, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. You know, it's kind of a dopey handle, but I change my handle about once every six months. Just, I only use Instagram to talk to like six people, you know, so I, I, I basically just come up with fun handles just for those six people to find me. But if Brad, I'll say I'll say this. I did not know about the grenade, the, the multiple times that you had a pin pulled grenade to save your life. So that actually <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Oh, my God. It was that, like half a dozen. I got not even I wish I could exaggerate that number, but it's that grenade is like the threat of that grenade, like got me out of a lot of bad situations. <laughs> and the fact that it said F Iraq on it was, was like cherry on the cake. But yeah, I mean, uh, when I started my Instagram back up in uh, September, you know, I had to shut it down for work and family reasons, but uh, I think it's M26 underscore lemon grenade. Um, that's about the only thing I got going on right now. I'm, but Brad also talks about the some of the uh, some of his experience on the M16A2 as our subject matter expert in M16A2 videos that are coming up on the Nine Hole Reviews channel. So if you tune in there, you'll see Brad come back on at a later date. But that aside, Brad, it's an absolute pleasure having you uh, sure. talk about some of those stories um, in Iraq. And I hope to see you back on the show if uh, at, at some point uh, there's a topic that you'd like to talk about or is there something that we could both explore together? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm always open. You know, I've got no problem talking. Uh, before I go, there's a General Mattis story that everybody loves and I want to okay. share. It. So going back to uh, the railroad bridge, you know, we're kind of like in a stalemate. We're on this railroad bridge and the way we worked it, one squad was on the bridge, one squad was uh rear security and like a checkpoint and then one squad was qrf and we just kind of rotated through so at when this happened i was uh, uh the checkpoint rear security and you know they're shooting rockets and mortars at us on a daily basis so if you didn't have to you stayed in your bunker you know we had to dug out with sandbags you know protection so it comes on the radio somebody named inchon six is coming inchon six was a code name for the uh, regimental colonel. So they're like, all right, and Chuck the colonel's coming. So this convoy of probably like a dozen vehicles, you know, like cats with 50 cows and, you know, Humvees with 50 cows, Mark 19s, LAVs, you know, this, just this entourage, you know, everybody's like primmed and proper, you know, they're wearing their flak properly with the neck, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they look good. You know, they come in, the colonel walks around, he gets back in his, uh, you know, command vehicle and they take off down the road, you know, so that was a regimental colonel convoy of like 12 vehicles, you know, everybody looking good. And then, you know, 30 minutes go by and we hear on the radio, chaos six will be here any minute. Like who, who is chaos six? It was me and my buddy Wallace, you know, we we're, were sitting in our hole. Like, I don't know who the hell chaos six is. One LAV comes like driving and it's got a million antennas on it, right? Like antennas everywhere. And this little old man jumps out, you know, no helmet, you know, no rank, you know, dirty as crap. He's got his sleeves rolled up like mid, mid length. He's got a 45 and like a, like a tanker holster cocked and locked. And he comes walking up. He's just like, Hey guys, how you doing? And we're just sitting here in a little hole with our helmets on, you know, just hoping we don't get more like doing pretty good, man. Like we, we knew he was an officer. We know he was like doing pretty good, sir. Like you might want to take cover. They're, they shoot mortars and rockets at us. Like, ah, not the first time, won't be the last. You guys doing okay? You need anything? Like, no, we're good. You just take care of yourself. Like, gotcha. And he walks away and like, who the hell is that crazy old man? It's General Mattis. <laughs> <laughs> this is General Mattis is walking up. Just don't, don't give two Fs. You know, just 45 cocked and locked, no helmet. Just want to see what's going on. Like, he lives up to his reputation. Yeah, yeah. They, well, another story I love telling. So uh, I was out of the city. My buddy, uh, Kevin you know, Keeley, you know, he was a corporal. He just picked up corporal before we hit Fallujah. So when the when they were in the city, uh, he took an ambush patrol out. So textbook ambush patrol, you know, they set up, uh, you know, covered position, waited for uh, the enemy to come in, and they took him out, killed like seven or eight insurgents. And uh, he was doing his debrief in the COC, and General Mattis happened to be sitting there. We don't, again, we don't know who General Mattis is. We we don't, 
he never wore rank. We didn't know like the level he was at. So he, here he is just listen to the squad leader corporal talking about, you know, this successful ambush patrol he ran. So fast forward to like a couple weeks later, they did a, a regimental, uh, uh, meritorious sergeant board, you know, we couldn't participate. We were in the city fighting. So I guess the only people that applied were, you know, truck drivers, admin, things like that. And I guess the story I was told, General Mattis looked at it like not one single combat vet applied for this meritorious sergeant. And they kind of told him like, well, they're all fighting, sir. What do you want us to do? Give it to that corporal that led that ambush patrol. What was his name? Keeley? Make him a sergeant. And, you know, he came back from patrol one day and they Stuck a sergeant chevron in his hand, like, congratulations, you're a sergeant. Get ready for your next patrol. He's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he went from corporal or lance corporal to sergeant in, like, four months, all because General Mattis, like, liked that ambush patrol he went on. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. That's a, that's a dude right there. That's that's leadership. Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah. But I got to get going. I got to cook dinner. All right. Well, no, it's it's again once once again it's a pleasure having you uh, on the show, and yeah. we hope to have you back. Now, as we close this episode up, I wanted to speak out to my fellow veterans out there. Self reflection is a valuable trait, and if you look in the mirror and you need help, reach out to your friends, your family, the VA, local veteran services departments, or nonprofits. Call the crisis line at nine eight eight if you need help. Family members too. Sometimes us veterans, we're not very good at asking for help. So take care of each other. We'll see you around.